Okay, so let's start. So uh, I'm coming from Desi, and Desi is a really fantastic place. I mean, with this Petra tree ring that it uh, has, uh, th that, that is in fact third generation uh, X-ray source, and then with flash and with European X, so it's a fantastic place to stay and to work uh, around. And uh, I will start with my machine learning because as soon as it was a subject of a few discussions and also in has um, also has very interesting talk yesterday about that and we published a couple of papers on that subject and but, but it was a little bit on another issue so when we were um, uh, but when we were interested in, uh, on machine learning, we were thinking to apply it to single particle imaging at uh, X-Files. And um, uh, in this case, as you know, we throw particles in random orientations, and then we have X-ray beam, and at the moment when it interacts with the beam, we get a diffraction pattern, and we assume that all particles are reproducible and x files are very much convenient for, for that due to the, their properties. And actually where we wanted to use uh, machine learning was on the following side. So we, we have data preprocessing, we have size filtering, and we have EM classification. So we have some part of classification step. And then we have to solve orientation problem and then we go, go to phase retrieval. And what we were thinking to do, is it possible to get around these steps and to pass away after data pre-processing to go to CNN classification and then to size filtering and then to our orientation step. And so we were using also one of the CNNs that is that Invo has shown yesterday and uh, um, Applying convolutional neural network is really kind of the mainstream at the moment. In the computer vision domain, CNNs have become de facto state of the art in image classification. The tested schemes allow classification of newly collected patterns independently without the need to recompute from the beginning. And so here we were having very simple kind of classification. So here we have a single hit class and we have non-single hit class. So we want, we have a, in, in fact binary classification and we want to distinguish between single hit and non-single hit class. And here how a loss function was behaving, but I have to say that I was not going into it and is in was going yesterday and was um, and was discussing how this loss function is uh, um, is made of from different parameters. Unfortunately, I haven't looked really inside. I, actually, I was thinking that it's kind of hidden in the whole process and I would not have any possibility to go into it. But um, interestingly that we take for training and validation set, we have taken 100 single hits and about 20,000 non-single hits. And this ratio was due to the fact that we have only few single hits in comparison on a large number of non-single hits. And that's why we decided to uh, uh, have the, this uh, ratio. And then it was a test set. Okay, and after this, we got 1,393 diffraction patterns, and they were going through extensive data augmentation step. And so after a um, few attempts, we have collected a different number of uh, diffraction patterns, so we have different strategies, and uh, um, in combination with the uh, um, the size selection and then and also um, um, uh, and, uh, and also using classification step and so then we were getting different number of diffraction patterns as you can see here but uh, interestingly that from all this classification we, we got more or less the, the same 
uh, the, the same result. And th that was kind of encouraging us. And the uh, resolution in these cases was varying from six to eight nanometers. Okay, now back to nanocosmos and to main subject of my talk. And uh, so if you look on this uh, book, that, that is Genesis book and it's called the white paper. And it's, it's, uh, it was written by, uh, put together by Helmut Dosch when he was still in Max Planck Institute in Stuttgart. And, um, but, but this is still relevant till now because, uh, and here the, this very nice slide from this book taken, and it shows that X-rays are really very well suited to study mm, nanoscience because uh, we are about one nanometer dimensions and the X-rays are from 10 to minus nine to 10 to minus 10 meters. And of course, it's very, very important for studying because they're uh, everywhere, that they're in health and medicine, in transport and space, communication and information, energy and environment, everywhere. And especially synchrotron uh, radiation facilities and x fells are really very nicely fit to that. Okay, so we have uh, a bunch of uh, X-ray coherent X-ray sources as APS, as uh, upgraded ESRF, as uh, Spring 8, and of course, Petra 3 ring that we are converting at the moment to Petra 4 ring. And uh, he, here are some, some examples taken from this paper of the Petra 3 um, uh, um, and uh, P10 design that we use quite extensively. And here is in diffraction mode, if we want to use a Bebrek CDI, then we use the, this um, equipment. Okay, now uh, a, a little bit uh, subject for more for um, um, uh, theory people. Uh, and this is so-called two-point angular cross-correlation functions that we are using quite extensively nowadays. And so what is that? So it is one of, of the small angle diffraction patterns measured at, um, at, uh, um, at Petra, let's say. And here is correlation function that, that we construct by combining two intensities, intensity at Q, vector one and intensity at Q vector two, and we perform averaging over the angle phi that, that is uh, around. And the, that is taken, so uh, we fixed uh, uh, the angle between these two vectors. And then we, we change delta and we, we always average uh, over here. But then but when we would have in diffraction pattern two peaks at momentum transfer vectors Q1 and Q2, um, uh, angular cross correlation function will have a peak at the same angle, delta. And this fact is very interesting in fact because we can use it first of all when we have um, when we eject nanoparticles into the beam then we can have sometime we have uh, we could have sometime two peaks and sometime few peaks and so in in this case it's very nice because it means that some of the particle is shining there and exactly in in the break geometry and then you can correlate it. And you can correlate also all diffraction patterns that, that are coming from here. But you can also assume that if you have a really um, nanoparticle with the high uh, unit cell, with the large unit cell value, that then you can perform kind of tomography experiment and you will collect all, uh, all values of the break peaks uh, uh, in 3D. And then but by using this uh, in 3D now, so you can extend your uh, approach to 3D and then you can correlate your intensities at Q1 and uh, Q2. And as you see at this delta value, you have peaks here and here. And so this will give you a peak 
in in the uh, cross correlation function that you construct like that. Okay. So now applications of coherent X-rays to nanoscience. And first of all, well, what I will talk about about coherent X-ray imaging of mesocrystalline gold grains. And so the, this uh, collaboration of University of Constance and Leibniz Institute and Petra III. Um, so mesocrystals are structures composed of numerous small crystals of similar size and shape and that are arranged in a regular periodic pattern. So uh, in, in fact, you uh, have your initial um, primary nanoparticle and, and then you put some uh, ligands uh, around and then with these ligands it's arranged in, in mesocrystal. So we performed this experiment at Petra 3 and so this was the sample that was kind of really not so nice, uh, but then we have source, we have CRLs to focus the beam and we have importantly we have a cryojet to cool the sample and then we have uh, our diffraction pattern. And then we were rotating our sample um, 180 degrees with 0.5 degree increment in order to, to collect uh, this in 3D. And that's how it looks like in 3D. And also, interestingly, so some of the break peaks were kind of, um, instead of one break peak, it was two break peaks. That, that tells us that it's some defects here. And also here, here is an average intensity. Okay, here, how it looks like in 3D, and you could see flares here due to the finite shape of the um, uh, sample, and also break peaks here that are quite distorted. And here, the, the, this one is double break peaks, as I have shown already. Okay. Yes, and the first thing that, that we applied to this, uh, to our analysis, it was uh, this cross correlation analysis, and you could see how these uh, curves uh, look like. And interestingly, that um, when we put optimized um, uh, cell structure that, that is shown here, then we obtained all the, the peaks that, that are shown here in, in the, um, the blue curve is experimental curve and red dots are sim simulated uh, results. So this was a result of this optimized peaks. But it was not the whole thing. As soon as we um, collected coherent diffraction patterns, so we managed to reconstruct it. And here is in 3D the shape, and here are the, the cuts. And we see that structure is really quite complicated. It has cracks, it had fit, fit cuts, it had an additional nanoparticle, and so on and so forth. And also lattice bending, we can see here. And here is a crack and point defect here. So it's a bunch of things that, that are happening here. OK, here it's in 3D, and you could enjoy looking on it. And here again, this said atoms. And so it, this was a really fantastic job. Um, yes, and then we uh, were looking a little bit more closely. So we, we took this XCCA structure as, a, um, as an average structure. And then we're looking on small displacements that, that were uh, uh, um, coming from the shift of the atoms from, from this average structure. And here you could see some selected Voronoi Dirichlet polyhedrons that that, we, that that in one place we have one polyhedron in another place another and in this place another and I think that uh, John Mao has uh, um, mentioned Varanoi already uh, in, in the beginning on, on the first talk. Okay, and then we looked on uh, um, the pair distribution function, and from this pair distribution function, we could obtain a resolution that, that was six nanometers. And that was quite high uh, resolution that we obtained for this. By fitting, the, the, this was obtained by fitting this green peak here. Okay, um, what else can be done? As soon as we know each 
displacement from uh, an average lattice, we, we, um, we managed to obtain, first of all, the, the full uh, 3D map of the strain tensor components and uh, rotation also, and also the, the sum of the diagonal elements of the strain gives you a so-called 3D dilatation map of this super lattice. And here, how it looks like in 3D. And so we see that it's quite mosaic and quite uh, distorted and has uh, uh, the extension or compression of things are happening. Okay, and th that's not the whole story. So we continue uh, this work. And so, for example, recently we've been making some experiments on different size of the particle and also different polymer weight. Here is size of the particle and here's polymer weight. And so you, here you could see the, the zoom of particles that were obtained. And um, if we measured, so we measured it first at P23 and we obtained this nice diffraction pattern. And so this can be again analyzed with the weights across relation analysis, and then you can get the structure. So, um, and f f from here, from the structure, we will go to that it's BC letters. Uh, but also it was possible to reconstruct uh, these particles, and you could see how, how nice that they look like. So it's m m much smaller particles. Uh, one of them is obtained from 56 nanometer octahedra, and another one from 44 nanometer octahedra. Okay, now we'll, I'm going to break. And so in, in this case, as we all know, we have sensitivity to strain. And so here, for example, you could see this additional intensity that, that is coming due to the fact that uh, lattice has shifted slightly. And so, yes, here I want to mention one thing, important thing. So as soon as we have this very simple approach and we have a shape function and we have a strain, we have a phase factor here that, that is uh, a projected strain field in the crystal. So for crystallographic samples, we get uniform distribution of strain, and that is what is used. But I have to, to point out that in BREC CDI, we do not get information about electron density, but we reconstruct the amplitude and phase of crystalline function associated with the given reflection. That's very important. Um, so, catalysis, it was very well presented in um, Henry Kim's talk, and here just a few uh, ideas about the, the same thing. When we have chemical reaction, then we have to overcome with the barrier, and of course, Catalysis is lowest this barrier, and then according to, to this Arrhenius equation, this cat catalytic process is going faster and easier. And so the, there are several number of DFT calculations, and of course we have these huge plants to, uh, to, to perform um, um, different processes, chemical processes, and they are all using catalytic particles for that. And uh, um, the, there are several catalytic particles, and platinum is one of the most famous ones. And we studied uh, this in collaboration with Andrea Stirli and with Desian Nanolab in, in a couple of publications recently. And um, uh, so I will talk about coherent diffraction imaging of a single platinum nanoparticle under operandi reaction conditions. So again, DFT calculations on platinum, that they show that uh, here, depending on the surface, how the surface will be moved or changed in this case. Okay, so here, how we collect the, the data, everybody knows this already. And so here is an incident beam, here is a defective beam, and here is a cap. So we will have beryllium cap in this case, and we collect uh, rocking curves. 
and uh, so uh, and here is our, our first of all we were studying the particle in the argon atmosphere and then we were getting amplitude and displacement map and you see here that it's a gap here and the gap is coming just from very simple uh, reasons so it's not that electron density is absent here particle is uh, the, the whole particle we have but due to the fact that, that we have some kind of phase boundary here so the, this part of the crystal is uh, reflecting to, to another direction and we, we by measuring one 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 reflection we just don't collect um, uh, intensity from this part Okay, now here is an argon atmosphere and here is an argon CO atmosphere and we see that there are some slight changes in the particle shape. They're really not very strong, but the, the, this still will have to see these changes. And here again, this uh, now it's strain here and uh, so we, we see on the surface, so in argon CO case, it's a little bit uh, stronger, higher in values of strain, and here is inside the particle, and again, in the case of argon CO, we, we see that the strain is a little bit higher. And here is a histogram of the bulk strain and histogram of the surface strain, and we see this shift be between these two values for, for argon CO and pure argon. Okay, so we continued it and uh, recently we published in Science Advances. And so again, what is important in uh, this uh, research that we could um, really track on which particle we do um, CDI. So that, that is very important. I think by IFM we can look uh, before the, um, um, the, the uh, experiment and after experiment we could check how the, the particle is looking like. So in this case we used four conditions for um, so PPO argon first and then argon CO, then argon CO plus plus oxygen and then again argon CO. And so here are conditions of the experiment and again it was DOM uh, here used and so we don't see the, the particle and so it's really a trouble to, to find it there. And here how diffraction patterns look like from this particle. It was all in one, one, one uh, reflection geometry. Um, especially for uh, people who are dealing with mathematics. So here this, uh, what we used for the uh, obtaining, uh, so uh, performing reconstruction and what we obtained for the strain field, and so here how our cycles were going. Um, and here is a uh, result. So here is the shape of the particle under different conditions, and here is the strain field. And what was important here is you can see here that uh, with the oak, here is oxygen, you see. So we see that in this case, particles were under uh, really catalytic reaction and that's very important so that, that's partial pressure of oxygen after um, in, in the um, in, in the mass spectroscopy after the catalytic reaction okay and so here we see cuts how it is and so and then here is very important plot where we try to understand how the facet strain is evolving depending on the catalytic reaction where we see that under argon it's all about zero more or less some are strained positively and even more positively and here like here and when we uh, change to co then then we see that it's becoming closer to zero value and here it's also shifted a little bit to the left and one 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 facet is on the contrary to the right and then when we turn to argon to co that then it more or less comes back okay and 
here it's also um, interesting. So we're estimating uh, resolution, and so here are different values of uh, resolution depending on the facet. And here we used uh, the, this paper that, that is uh, known quite well for us, and uh, and because we were looking for um, uh, resolution in different uh, facet directions, and that's why it was varying depending on the facet also. Okay, so then I'm coming to another topic. So we were uh, interested also in understanding the structure of the nanowires, and th this was in collaboration with Nanolund, and here is our purpose publication in nano letters and uh, um, nanowires are very important uh, really for different things and we have now different applications and light emitting downs and diets are made from nanowires and you see different colors and but, but, but here it's still a big problem is so-called uh, uh, green uh, light problem because uh, the sensitivity uh, of um, of g green light is go going down as soon as you approach it and so th that is for nanowise so and you try to tackle this with uh, different combinations of different materials but still it is uh, Problem. And then an another interesting issue is that uh, you have uh, piezoelectricity in, in some of the um, uh, cases, and especially for gallium nitrate nanowires, you have piezoelectric effect. And that's what we started, in fact. So with gallium nitrate nanowire with gold contacts. And we have either free line nanowires that were from 3.2 to 3.2. 0.5 micron in length and the, um, about 350 to 400 nanometer in diameter. And you could see how we put contacts to this nanowires. And then we were putting this nanowires into the beam and we we're collecting coherent diffraction patterns. So as soon as we have no contacts, so that then you see this very nice hexagonal shape uh, nanowire with very many uh, fringes here, but as soon as you apply contact, so immediately this diffraction pattern is becoming, is changing. And especially interesting thing that, that this uh, apparently in 3D is something is growing here. And um, for nanowire without context, we managed to reconstruct it, and so it has a very nice shape. But unfortunately, this nanowires we haven't managed to reconstruct. And here is for one volt, you could see. And as soon as you apply high voltage, then this part is growing here. And for 10 volts, it's even big, and for 15 volts, it's even higher. And of course, these fringes are becoming very much disturbed as well. And after that, it's breakdown, and you could see that it's burned just completely. So we analyzed it really in, in the details, and we were looking on the break evolution and the applied voltage, and we noticed that uh, there are kind of two break peaks in in the um, in uh, this case, uh, and so we, we thought that it's due to the bending of the nanowire, and here how, how this angle was evolving as soon as we apply voltage, it's in here. And then we made a model, um, FEM model of the nanowire. So we assumed that it is bent like that. And we could uh, analyze the displacement profile uh, depending on that. And after that, after 15 volts, it was broken. And here is the strain field and the stress is quite a bit of stress. It was a, uh, so it was 1.2. Pascal family. And so from that measurements, we were able to obtain a piezoelectric constant that, that was 7.7 .7 picometer per volt, and ultimate tensile strain was uh, stress was 1.2 kg. 
give you Pascal. Okay, and in the end, uh, I would talk a few, few uh, slides I have about the fraction limited storage rings. And so, as I said already, Tetrafo is our ultimate 3D microscope, and we, are, um, we, we had already a conceptual design report, and now we're working on TDR for, for this project. And uh, so, um, brilliant, so as you we all know the brilliance is calculated like that, where this is staying for RMS value of the size of the source, and the, this is divergence of the source. And so coherent flux can be calculated very easily from the brilliance, and that's just a number of half squared multiplied by brilliance. And so emittance here is emittance, and due to Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, emittance is always bigger or equal to lambda over 4 pi squared. And when it's equal, so that, that is called diffraction uh, limited storage rate. And so um, we have this curve, and here is uh, ultimate rings, and here I think, so here is uh, average brightness, and of course, it fields are higher. But what is interesting, uh, this parameter is interesting, photon degeneracy parameter. And so it's quite high. If for the present rings, it's about 1% one, 1%, we have. Then for ultimate storage rings, it would be about 100. So it's quite high, and it's even higher for FELs. And we were interested in uh, understanding what we could get at uh, the uh, at Petra flooring. And so we were assuming that we have 10 picometer um, emittance for this ring. And then we were estimating, we were working on different things, uh, like um, how it would be uh, behaving, and so uh, depending on the energy of the X-rays, and so we obtained for 500 EV for 10 picometer, we, we could, could see that it's nearly uh, highly fully coherent, but already for 12 kV it would be less coherent and even less for 24 or less for 50 kV. But interesting thing here is that asymptotic limit of the photon emittance was lambda over 2 pi and not lambda over 4 pi as it is for Gaussian sources. And that is coming due to the fact that, um, that synchrotron radiation is not a Gaussian source. And so another thing is was to calculate coherent fraction, and again from coherent fraction we were getting that uh, it's nearly one for 500 EV, and it's less coherent for 12 kV, and then even less for up to 50 kV. And so we understand from that that to reach the fraction limit, at least at one. At 12 kV, you have to push to one picometer uh, radian and probably below, and that is uh, technologically is not possible at the moment. And then we will look on the number of modes, and we see here that for 500 TV, number of modes is three to four, but then for 12 kV, we have already about 10th mode, and then it's higher for energies. And so different color here it indicates different energy spread effects that and we could observe more modes and produce coherence for um, for the energy spread for different energy spread. Okay, so that's coming to the Petra 4 and so we plan additional experimental hole here in this part of the ring. And uh, so it is 6, six GV uh, electron energy, and we aim for about 20 picometer uh, radian horizontal emittance. And we want to increase the number of undulated ports to 35 and 28 plant at the moment. So few are left uh, open. And so here it was a project timeline, but now we already shifted it to a new startup in 2029. And so by that I'm finishing, and so coherent 
pixel diffraction imaging is really great uh, technique. It allows to image in forward uh, geometry in 3D non-periodic samples, colloidal crystals that I haven't shown today, mesocrystal and grains. It allows to image in break geometry in 3D and nanocrystals uh, and the different external conditions, shape and strain, and the crystals and the cat catalysis conditions, nanowise, and then diffraction limited sources are especially well suited. And here is my group, and uh, th this was made already a few years ago, before pandemic, and now we would have to update it with these new people. And here are former members, and thank you very much.